managing partner of FedTech. Really excited to be with you today. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces, um, including a number from our most recent uh, startup studio that just kicked off this last weekend. So hi, hi folks, good to see you back. Um, and this is the uh, second installment of, of what we're uh, calling our FedTech Fireside Chat series. Um, and uh, what we're, you know, when our team, just to give you kind of the origin of this, when our team came together a few weeks ago and thought, you know, hey, what could we do to contribute, you know, to the community during this, this challenging time, you know, one of our ideas that bubbled up was let's highlight um, some of the, the wisdom and experiences from our amazing uh, mentor network. Um, so this is, we heard from Sid Olbeck from Lockheed Martin last week. Today we have uh, Bob, and I'll just say B is his last name because I'm still learning how to pronounce that. I'll, I'll let Bob do it. But uh, Bob has had an amazing career um, across really the venture world and industry and is going to share um, really, I think, a handful of insights. He's one of my favorite mentors with our program. He was in my pitch group uh, last fall, so I got to really see a lot of how he works with startups. And uh, yeah, I'm super excited just to uh, have, have Bob here today. Bob, uh, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Hey, super. Th thanks, Ben. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, hi to everybody virtually. Uh, and uh, I guess at the end of this, uh, this exercise, we'll all be studio executives how to do virtual uh, presentations and uh, personalities, right? Uh, so, so with that, I, I, uh, I, I was really thankful to get the opportunity to be asked to talk to the entrepreneur group uh, a little bit here. And um, I thought that, um, you know, going through this experience several times in my career, <clears throat> I remembered that um, at this particular time when you're really trying to launch your first ideas or maybe coming back to entrepreneurial ideas, you know, it's, it's a lot of external stuff. You're trying to take in a lot of information. You're trying to meet a lot of different people. It's a lot of, you know, one way it seems like external to you. So I thought what would be good to talk to a little bit about is just you, the entrepreneur, and to really focus on how well uh, do we know ourselves and a way to know yourself a little better. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I wanted to offer that as a pivot away from the usual instruction of, you know, d you know broaden your networking, uh, deepen your research, and uh, read the latest management theory. And, and all of that is good to keep up on, but um, it's, it's not all that you need. And what you really need is to know yourself better. Uh, so, uh, and Lindsay, let me know if the slides or my audio, just, just you know, uh, give me a chat to uh, tell me if it's uh, working or not. Uh, so, you know, part of this is that uh, entrepreneurial efforts, you know, they're very demanding. They're very solitary, isolating sometimes. Uh, and, um, you know, you're, you're really living in a world where people are telling you no a lot, you know, the word no. And if they don't tell you, uh, when you leave the room, they talk about that they doubt you, right? So, so that can be something to absorb. And, and so, you know, Entrepreneur efforts, you know, they're just demanding in that way. And you, you spend some time knowing yourself because this process is going to show you what you don't know about yourself. It's going to bring it to the surface, right? So, so what the point of this is, is it's a good time to prepare and, and, and work on that. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, I think that'll make you a more effective entrepreneur. And, and, and you know, if you've been a part of this, you've heard some great stories from successful entrepreneurs and they all start out with sort of a, a dip in talking about their failures on the way to success. But the common denominator that if you listen to these stories, they all bring you back to is they talk about the need for personal perseverance and personal conviction, right? You know, to understand why you're here. And all of them that I've talked with and listened to over the years, including myself, um, will tell you that if you're just chasing money uh, and that's your reason to do something, it's not going to be enough. It's, it, it won't be enough. And so you really have to understand why am I here? Because that question will, you're going to ask yourself that quite a bit. Um, so, um, you know, let's talk a little bit about you know, a simple exercise we all can do, and I'll, I'll just take us to the next chart. And um, 
you know, you, you can create a sort of a simple uh, timeline, a chronology of things. And the importance of this is list out things that were activities that you decided, you decided to do, you initiated, right? And so these are the larger events of what you participate in. And it kind of starts where your adult judgment started in high school someplace, hopefully. Uh, and, and kind of carries through, but just examine these things. I gave a couple of prompts, examples of, uh, you know, what were the activities? Why did you join them? Why did you continue them? And most importantly, what we're trying to do from the exercise is what do you learn? And more importantly, what did you adopt from doing them? Okay. And um, let, me, let me show you a couple examples just using, uh, using my own uh, exercise here. Let me advance this, if you can see this now. So, so one of the things early on I wanted to do was uh, be, a, be the quarterback of my high school football team, right? And, um, you know, I, I had some good skills and I was confident enough, but I wasn't this alpha-sized athlete. You know, I, I wasn't the obvious choice, let's say. And, um, but, but I did that and the, the team was okay. I mean, we, we did our share of losing, uh, I would say. And, and with that, you know, I found out that losing was just, it was awful. I, I felt awful about it. And, and uh, being the quarterback in this role, you, it's just like the NFL, you, you feel like you're responsible for everything. Every missed pass, every interception, every fumble, uh, even missed blocks, right? You, know, you feel like it's your fault. And th there's this pressure that, that happens uh, because not everybody has this Tom Brady result. I mean, most quarterbacks, even the best ones, uh, and high performing ones go through the same thing. They have this incredible pressure, this negative experience. And you ask yourself the question seriously, you know, why am I doing this, right? Why am I, why am I here? What keeps me going? And I asked that question and, and I, I found the answer in what, what happened to me, which was every time I would go to sleep after a game, whether we won or lost, I had the same thoughts, whether we won or lost, which was, um, I saw the defense and I was playing the game to be disruptive. I craved, that's why I played the game. I, I, I wanted to disrupt the defense. I saw that as my role. That was my whole purpose. And that was, became the reason that I accepted why I would hang in there, no matter how bad the game went, no matter how bad the season went, uh, no matter how much pressure on the negative side, that one thing, that one idea to be able to be disruptive outweighed all the other uh, negative things and kept me going, perseverance. Um, a little bit later, you know, going on in the exercise here, um, I was at the University of Maryland. I was pursuing a, a business degree there, and uh, it came time for an upper class elective. And, uh, you know, I, I needed to keep a, an A GPA type of uh, uh, selection and grade point average. And, uh, you know, I, I looked at different options and there was uh, some stuff that was a uh, history of film, which was perceived to be an easy, you know, thing I could do. Or there was this astronomy class and it was taught by the dean of the department, this astrophysicist. And for whatever reason, I didn't really understand. I, I just, I, I selected astronomy and, and it was hard. It was incredibly hard. It was a ton of reading. Uh, all the testing was uh, Socratic essays. You know, you had to explain one theory versus the other and uh, so forth. And, uh, you know, d during that workload, which I was pretty busy doing a lot of other stuff, as we all are academically, I, I asked myself, well, what am I doing here several times? Why did I do this, right? And in fact, one time I was in the uh, professor's office hours asking for some help. And he actually asked me, what, what are you doing here? right? Why are you in this class? You're the only business major in this grad level uh, astronomy sciences class. And I told him, uh, having been asked, it prompted me to say, you know, everything else I'm studying is explaining to me things happening here on earth. And you're this guy that's pointing to the deep black abyss of space and saying, I can tell you what's going on out there. And I was just hooked by that, I was fascinated by that, that, uh, that curiosity of mine. And, and my, it was my authentic curiosity that, that kept me from quitting in that class. And a little later in the semester end, uh, 
he told me he said he'd never issued a lower A minus uh, in, in the history of his teaching. And but I, you know, I took that to say that, you know, my authentic curiosity had had brought him on my team of, of my goal pursuing that, so that he was trying to he was trying to do his part to help encourage me stay on that path, and and that was effective, and and he had. Uh, you know, he had respected that, uh, that part of, uh, and valued that. So, um, you know, what's all this got to do with, uh, entrepreneurship? Uh, you, you know, we, we, we kind of bring it back to what are my choices going forward in, in my life. And so I had a goal to be a, you know, when I was a young man to be a player in the IT business, which was, you know, brand new and making headlines all the time. And, uh, I ended up interviewing for a job that uh, was with this business VP and, and the job was a NASA uh, assignment. And uh, he said, you know, to tell me, tell me why, you know, you instead of all these other candidates. And, and I told him my astronomy story, right? And that was effective in, in getting him to support my goal. And he knew that my curiosity, I'd stick with the job. I'd make something happen. Right. And I wouldn't quit. A little bit later, uh, you know, down the road, now I'm running uh, all the federal labs uh, in the same same type of assignment. Um, that's similar to a scope that what FedTech's doing today is, is DOE, DOD uh, labs at NIH and NASA. And um, I, I was doing well and, and the team was making money and the business was growing. But along the way, I saw that um, we started to see bids that uh, were different. They started talking about new software languages and applications that ran on distributed processing. And I paid attention to it and thought about it. And then about a little time after that, I took a, a big high dive into the software business. And I was the 26th employee of this startup down in a couple of uh, townhouses in Old Town Alexandria right here in Washington, D.C. And um, I, I remember uh, my interview with the, the CEO, he asked me, why are you here, right? Well, why do this? You know, you're, you're with this really successful company, you're a successful guy, you got all this traditional direction going on in the career, why, why, why do this, right? And I told him that I believe in what you're doing is going to be disruptive. And I, I know that what, I don't know what this is going to produce going forward. I know I have to be a part of it and I'll never look back because I, I need to be a part of disruptive uh, things. It, it's my nature. It's my true self. You know, I know that I will persevere whatever this requires. And I did. And we, we took that company public in 1996 and learned a ton of things through the, the, uh, uh, the IPO process going public. And then I was recruited to be a chief revenue officer uh, with another software company that we took public just about 2000. And I was recruited into PricewaterhouseCoopers who was trying to go public as a consulting services company when 9-11 happened. And then a little short time after that, the following six months a year, uh, IBM bought all of PWCC. And uh, that's how I ended up in, uh, in IBM doing uh, a very familiar role, which was IBM was one of the largest research assets in the world. Uh, and they were trying to bring that technology forward in the form of uh, solutions to commercial and governments I ran the Smarter Cities uh, effort doing that for North America as part of a global team. And uh, that's sort of how things came full circle. And so, so my point to you today is, uh, you know, insight, your personal insight shapes your outcomes a lot more than you think. And follow your, your real curiosities, be an authentic self, uh, and persevere. Know, know why you'll persevere, know why you won't quit. And the answer won't be money. It won't be about that. It'll be about something else. And so it's a simple discussion to just get started as the way to examine that a little bit. So let me take a big breath. I'll throw it back to uh, 
to Ben. Uh, maybe there's some questions and uh, other things we want to talk about. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you sort of think about, um, I guess for me, first of all, what what are you doing now? You know, it's a weird period of time. Like, how are you keeping uh, your personal momentum, you know, during a time when I think, you know, one of the challenges that we're hearing entrepreneurs, you know, talk about is just, um, you know, having a little lack of direction, having a little different working, you know, environment. I'm just curious, how are you staying focused? Yeah, that's a good question. It is a challenge. A um, <clears throat> um, couple things. Um, one is uh, I'm keeping up mentoring and doing a little bit of consulting to entrepreneurial firms uh, that are in various stages of startup. And um, I do that through a number of different channels. Some of it's direct consulting, but also um, I'm a member of different uh, associations uh, like uh, uh, Maryland Technology Council and, uh, and of course, uh, working with FedTech uh, and some other things and, and uh, sort of just hearing how uh, entrepreneurs are in fact dealing with things. And so what I'm doing is I'm doing an exercise in listening, Ben. I'm, I'm listening to see how people are reacting to this. And uh, that's, that's one thing. Um, the other thing I'm doing is uh, a little bit of volunteer work in something completely disconnected to that, just to um, sort of exercise your brain in a different direction. Uh, and sometimes that's really good because you can get way stressed out and down a rabbit hole of reasons why something won't work. And, you know, how do you cope? How do you, how do you deal with that? And sometimes helping other people is one of the best methods of sort of leveling yourself out and keeping yourself thinking and going forward. Uh, so, so, so that's a, you know, just a, a beginning answer to that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, and, and just for folks on the line, you know, what we uh, do in these sessions is uh, we'll have, you know, kind of some short discussion, but then really open it up to questions. So I see some of you are starting to add questions into the chat, you know, please continue to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, let's all I'll start to read them. Um, so uh, from from uh, newbie, one of our fed tech alums, thanks for the question uh, to Bob, what would you consider to be your biggest failure? And what convinced you to persevere during that time? Uh, wow, that, that's a great question. Uh, glad I could be on camera and being recorded to admit that one. Uh, didn't mean to scare everybody uh, coming online here. So, um, gosh, w w one of the biggest failures. I, I don't don't know that I put the question that way. It's it's. Um, I would say challenges are uh, really really to. It was a hard journey to know myself. You know, I. I um, it, why I'm on this topic is that, you know, I, I found out that, you know, disruption is a motivator to me. Well, you know, that's great, but, you know, where does that fit in, right? Who wants to hire a disruptive personality, right? And what do you do with it? Uh, but eventually, I, I found a, a way to apply it, uh, which was uh, my general attitude, uh, whether I'm coaching girls soccer uh, or whether I'm, you know, deep uh, into an IPO and driving revenue. And, and trying to grow a company, um, you know, your your okay is not good enough. I'm one of these personalities that looks at things and sees a way that it could become better. Uh, and so, um, you know, when you're in an organization answering to uh, other executives or working with other people, um, everybody's, you know, you, you run into no shortage of alpha male, or alpha males, but alpha individuals, right? And um, you have to make a habit and grow comfortable with telling truth to power as the saying goes, right? Speak your mind and, um, uh, and have reasons to do things. And, and so that took me a while to figure out how to apply that. Great, yeah, thanks, thanks Bob. Um, another question um, from the, the group, um, how do you know when to pivot versus persevere? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, sometimes you don't, right? Uh, so sometimes that's not always your decision. Um, one, one way to sort of help yourself do that is, is um, 
like this time right now, uh, we have a very disruptive environment. Um, one of the, the good things to be doing is if you have an idea or you're involved with an organization that's involved with an idea, uh, try and look at that idea and take things away from it that you think are essential. And by doing that, you might exercise the idea to find that what you thought was essential is not really so essential or there's different routes around it, right? And so what I'm suggesting as an answer is you go through a logical examination of what you're pursuing and why and what you think the fundamental um, supports are to it. Uh, and, um, and then sort of play around with, uh, you know, how flexible is the idea? What are the real dependencies? And that answer, that thinking may lead you to, uh, boy, we should, this is just, there's no way this is going to work. And maybe that's a, a decision that you can make and, and decide to, you know, pivot away from pursuing the idea versus maybe changing some fundamental things of how you're going after it. Uh, so, well, so, I'm wondering, like, were there specific examples that you, you kind of think of where you faced that dilemma when you were building a product, whether it was at IBM or, or other places? Yeah, I mean, it, that's, a, that's a good uh, uh, question for that. Um, a lot of ideas seem great uh, and uh, or alliances seem great to pursue. Uh, but you do the business case behind them and you may think that it solves a great technical problem, but there's no way to make money out of it. And, or the way to the uh, return on investment uh, really isn't supported by the sales channel. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of times business agreements are great on paper, but by the time you get them out to the field, they don't work because either the incentives aren't in place uh, human behavior barriers to adoption are too high. Uh, and so you have to be very pragmatic about uh, how you examine things and see that they're going to work and test them in the real world before you launch them as investment worthy ideas. Yeah, thanks, Bob. You know, and it's, it's interesting. I'm just drawing some parallels to our uh, fed tech companies and what we've seen, you know, that idea of, of uh, when is it, you know, the right time to, to pivot? We've seen, um, you know, a handful of companies kind of be maybe overly stubborn, but then it's also this kind of uh, dilemma, right, of that the world typically, you know, pushes back initially with new ideas, new products, you know, new companies. So you do have to sort of push through that initial level of um, resistance and pain. Um, and we've seen companies that are able to do that, you know, be, be successful. So it's an interesting yeah, kind of uh, back and forth that you have to have with yourself there. Yeah, I mean, it's very common to fall in love with the, and IBM was very guilty of this, but it's a great company full of great people, but a common mistake is to fall in love with the technology for technology's sake. Look how great this thing is, right? Very common mistake. Right, we need to bring this to market. We need to get, you know, 150 salespeople trained up on it. And um, all before the actual pilot of the business case and the value to a client was actually tested. And you can do these things in advance. You can do them through a methodology. But as would happen you know, in organizations of all kinds, um, a lot of times that, that condition is, is sort of not cheated, but, but not, not good enough, right? So um, you know, re really trying to uh, look at more than just the product, more than just the uh, technology itself, what's the solution value? Not as you see it, but as the market uh, would see it. How would they answer that question? And that's a very deliberate methodology. And FedTech goes uh, pretty deeply in, in this uh, cohort, and the, and the boot camp uh, you know, kicks that off uh, uh, very prominently. So I think that's the right direction. Great, thank you. Um, another question from the group. What's your view of being a generalist versus being a specialist uh, in terms of being successful in a startup? Um, so, uh, I think you have to become both, um, in this way, um, a generalist, certainly the, the broader perception you have of what's going on and a, a broader interpretation of the macro, if you will, of what we're doing in the big picture is always important. And it keeps you into doing solid strategic thinking, right? Uh, and also, it 
uh, gives you a, a, uh, a proper value for other people's opinions. You, know, you sort of see how they fit in, right? Um, the, the specialist is more of the you know, deeper dive micro uh, analysis of why something's important or why something needs to be in or out of the idea. Uh, so it's, it's more of the, uh, the, the uh, analytics of it. Um, but you, you have to really try and, and do both, uh, certainly at a competency so that you can appreciate the team around you because it's not going to be a one-man band, okay? It's not, it's not just one person that makes this success happen. So, um, you know, I, I think you want to, to develop in both directions is my answer. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. And just um, kind of moving on a little bit. So uh, Jeff from the audience has asked, um, so sort of this notion, it's all, it's uh, Jeff will probably get this question, right? So um, kind of a, a change in his thinking that it's actually riskier to stay put in a, a conventional job than it is to start a, a company. Um, and I guess how would you kind of weigh the risks for folks that are considering it? You know, how risky is it? Are there ways to mitigate the risk, um, you know, in general? Like, how would you advise maybe if you think about you're, you're still at IBM and, for example, and you are debating starting a company, what, what goes into your thinking? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. It's also a very personal question. Um, all people are simply not the same. Everything is a unique experience. Um, you know, uh, what I took away from my experiences is not the same thing that uh, other people that I work side by side with did. They would tell you different answers. Um, so that's the first thing is, is to understand, and then part of why I started out with understanding your authentic self uh, is something where, you know, what fuels you? What do you respond to? What do you need to do, right? I found, as my example was, I needed to be in a disruptive environment. I, I had no fear of that. I looked at risk differently. So you got to ask yourself questions about that because, um, you know, personally, getting involved in, in the startups and, and just entrepreneurial things in general are full of stress. Um, they are time demanding. It is a loss of control of your life. So uh, some of that is um, <clears throat> something you can control and, and different coping and different methods, but some of it's not. And sometimes it just doesn't fit where you are in your life. Um, you know, I, I did all this global running around and startup stuff, and then I had a family and it all worked out the right way for, for us. But, um, you know, it's, it's a balance. And I had to make decisions about balance and commitments all along the way. Uh, so uh, just consider that it, it, it's not fancy. It's not, it's not a lot of scientific stuff you can think about. It, it's knowing yourself, knowing what you are really fueled by, and also who's dependent upon you. Because uh, it's a very selfish thing to be an entrepreneur. It's very consuming, meaning that. So, you know, you got to have, uh, uh, be prepared to strike a balance with, it's not just you going to go through that. It's anybody else in your life is going to go through that. I think it's great. Yeah, I always consider my wife to have been our uh, first investor in, in FedTech, even though she didn't, you know, consciously write a check, you know, she was the one that sort of was uh, having the stable job when we were getting going and before, you know, there was ever a hope of revenue. Um, so that's really, really very true. Yeah, um, all, all I can say is amen to that. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, just to, to add on a piece of interesting advice, I, I heard I was in a, in a talk uh, one time from the founder of Zeus, which is a, a Again, I've been out of the dating game for a while, so I don't I know this website, but it's, it's uh, you know, a dating platform. And he gave, you know, great advice saying that, you know, if you are going to have 50 years of work in your life, um, if you spend six months, you know, doing a startup and trying that, it's a pretty small percentage, right, of your total working career. What you learn in that six months is probably such a unique thing that, that propels you, you know, even if you were to go back into a big organization. Um, that I, that, that sort of stuck with me, right? That we, we, we work for a long time. Um, so in, in a lot of ways, you don't have a lot to lose by trying something uh, on your own, but uh, okay. Well, thank you, Bob. So just moving on to the next questions sure. here. So um, how do you assemble and recruit a high performance team at different phases of your startup? And I'd be especially interested in, in some, um, hearing your thoughts on how do you do that when you're resource constrained, especially? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, again, um, 
you know, one of the things you need to inventory is what do you bring to the game, right? What, what are your core strengths? And you've got to be realistic about it. You know, not everybody's a natural uh, salesperson. Not everyone's a natural uh, executive willing to, you know, lean out decisions, make, make the hard decisions. Um, and not everyone is a technical genius that just sort of picks it up and runs with it, right? And says, oh, this is, this is easy. This is a snap, right? I see how to do this. Um, so all of those people are immensely valuable and, and necessary. <clears throat> so you got to figure out, start with, which one of those do you think you are? And um, you know, in my case, uh, I started out as a generalist. Uh, I think we had an earlier question about that. But um, I developed expertise in the business side deeply uh, to where the point where the entire payroll of the startup was dependent on whether my business strategy and my sales plan was going to work or not, right? Because we were literally in a cash and carry type of existence, just to put a point on it, right? Uh, so you got to figure out which one of these folks, what, what role uh, are, and functions and, and skills are you? And then, you know, go find, and right now is, a, is an excellent time to broaden um, relationships for purposes. So if, if you need uh, someone that gets the business side of this or can take you deeper into your research, uh, those are the people that you should be trying to reach now. And how you find them is, is really hiding in plain sight. There's so much information today as compared to then, uh, then being just a few years ago, uh, you know, uh, LinkedIn, FedTech, all, all of the associate uh, uh, technology and research uh, associations are, are just a plethora of, of uh, people and resources to do that. So think about a plan of, of who you are and then what is additive to you know, a complete organization uh, to support an idea and then go from there. I think you're muted, Ben. Oh, sorry, I'm on, I was on mute. Uh, thank you, Bob, great, great, great answer. Um, so, uh, so actually more of a, a question kind of about um, some of your experience with smart cities. So can you share more about smart cities, um, you know, smart cities, especially in the context of opportunities for startups? Yeah, so, so Smart Cities um, was a, uh, a brilliant strategy from IBM um, to really trying to uh, accomplish sort of uh, government as an enterprise, if you will, uh, meaning that most of government, uh, if anybody spent any time in, in government organizations or even doing business with them, are very vertical siloed, budgeted uh, siloed, organizations, right? Everything is this way and very little gets shared this way. Uh, add politics to that and, um, you know, it, it's, it's a very complex field. Smarter Cities was trying to uh, get uh, uh, data to be shared in an enterprise fashion in a vertical uh, structure. So it, it had challenges and of course the budgets um, were complicated to do that too, because you had to get uh, an enterprise idea fed from uh, funding from these silos. So everybody had to do buy-in. It was a unique uh, proposition. Um, but um, there is just a huge amount of opportunity to how do you deliver government services better uh, and meaning the function of government itself. And you do that at the local level, it goes on at the city level, at the state level, and of course the federal level. And we're watching it on display right now. And you can see that the biggest challenges of say the, the current administration responding to the crisis is for everybody to know the same thing at the same time. And that's an example of what uh, Smarter Cities uh, was, was really trying to do, was, was be able to push information out to the edge where it was needed, when it was needed, right? And so to do that, absent of politics uh, and in an ability to actually execute, uh, you know, was, was, was not easy. And we're seeing that it's problematic uh, to respond to our current crisis. Um, so let me take a breath and maybe you want to refine uh, just going from that answer to something maybe I missed. No, I think that was great. 
um, yeah, if there's any follow-ups that are related to smart cities, guys, just please put them into the, the chat. Um, kind of moving on. Uh, yeah, Bob, definitely catch, catch your breath. Uh, but uh, <laughs> um, we have a question about um, how do you sort of balance the idea of, of being an introvert, um, which I don't picture you being one, but, but for <laughs> how would you, if you were, um, you know, running a startup as a CEO, um, you know, what's, what's your thought on that? And, and I think, you know, especially in fed tech, we deal with a lot of, uh, people coming from a research background, you know, where their experience in the lab is very different from being out of leading a venture. Um, what would you, you know, say in terms of, of, uh, you know, the folks that are, are you know, considering that journey as an introvert or as a technical person? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and one that's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty normal to uh, normal state of being, right? I, I, you know, what, what I know and what I can do was, was a lot of it was earned by the risks I took. Um, I, it's not natural for me to be on camera talking to a bunch of people uh, virtually. Um, it's still a struggle, but um, yeah, I'm willing to do it from all the risks that I subsequently or incrementally took along the way. And one of them was to deal with customers uh, and executives and people that had, uh, you know, in my time, early in my career, more personal power than I perceived I had, right? But I found a way to do that. So a lot of progress is by showing up, okay? That, that's one thing. So no matter whether you're extrovert or introvert, you can't skip that one. You got, you got to be present. You got to exist. You know, um, progress is a grip on the rock. And when that wave wants to wash off the rock, you, you got to keep your grip. So that is a lot about showing up and, and having a presence. Um, you can do a lot. You don't, don't accept the fact that you can't change. That, that's a big mistake because um, you don't have to be, uh, you know, a great order, but you have to know why you're in the room and what your message is. And you have to be able to make sense and people have to believe you. Uh, that is going to carry you a lot of the way. Now, trust and forming trusts in other people that can add the skills to what the organizational idea has to be in an entrepreneurial environment is critical as well. And you got to find a way that uh, you got to examine what makes you trust people or distrust people. And so that's all part of sort of, you know, knowing who you are and, and, and why you're there and uh, sort of understanding, you know, what do you relate to? What makes you trust others? It's not all the same reason, you know, among people. So um, everything is about you as the individual. The more you can understand yourself, the, the more these answers will come a little more naturally or organic to you. Uh, so, so let me uh, pause there and see, see if I answered that question a little bit. Yeah, I like that. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, great. Um, we'll do uh, just two more questions. Um, and then, uh, you know, these are, we, we keep these lunch sessions reasonably short. So. Um, we'll just ask uh, ask two more that are in the chat here. So, um, so Bob, in your opinion, when when exploring a new startup idea, is there a higher success rate staying in the same industry that you already know versus jumping into something you know new? Um, how do you how do you reconcile that? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. It's it's one that a lot of people will struggle with, which is why I started with where I, what I presented to you. Um, you know, uh, you got to know what you're going to respond to. What, what fuels you, right? What motivates you? Um, what seems scary to some people is ordinary to others. So you got you to do a little self-examination about that. And I, 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 I know I keep coming back to a broken record. Of you got to know more about yourself, but, but that's why I was talking about it. It's very important. Um, you know, I, I, um, I stayed in technology, but I ended up taking a high dive into software, which I knew nothing about. Okay, I mean, I, I had uh, the, the same kind of confidence and skill set that made me try out for the high school quarterback thing. I applied to that career decision. I believe that I could figure out how to swim in the software ocean. And, and eventually I was right, but it, you know, it was hard, right? So um, to, to the question is specifically I can ask, um, you know, Human beings have this instinct, right? And, and if you can understand something deeply, then your capacity to learn quickly and broaden your perspective on it can be uh, assisted by your expertise. Um, 
it's all in how you see it. You don't want your expertise to define the answer to you. You want your expertise to allow you to listen better and sort of you know, build a, an organic understanding of it by participation with others. And then you know, I, I wouldn't shy away from telling you you should go deeper in only what you know. Uh, because uh, half the things I'm doing right now is I, I volunteer in other organizations where I know nothing about them. But that exercise teaches me something uh, and teaches me about my thinking on other things. And so that's just how we are as, as human beings. Uh, and I would take advantage of it. We're, uh, we're uniquely equipped, much more than you think, to adapt to dynamic change and disruptive things. We're conditioned as we, we go through society that we can't. We're told that we can't. But in fact, human beings have this enormous capacity for change and adaption and, and, and survival and dynamics, right? So uh, don't sell yourself short. <laughs> I like that a lot. Um, so yeah, so last question, Bob. Thank you again for all this. Um, so this is one that's close to our heart with FedTech. So uh, from, from Gabriel, uh, in the case of a technology that's transferred from a research lab, how do you know when the product is, is ready enough? So thinking about you know, our, our companies, when you go from lab to a new company, when is that product ready enough you know, to start selling or to potentially even you know, get out in front of investors? Yeah, that's a great question, very pragmatic question. Uh, one of them is, you know, what, what leads to knowing that is, is a breakdown of your interviews, talking to the market interviews uh, is, is enormously important because it gets you uh, confirmation or denial of your assumptions. Uh, and um, that's invaluable to do. Um, you know, I think that you have to, once you absorb the, the nuance of the technology or functionality, whatever it is, uh, really the discipline of the use case and monetizing the use case. In other words, how does this thing make money? And uh, to what scale can it uh, be applied to do so? And in what time box of performance all become the real critical questions. And it's, 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 complicated things, but once you sort of absorb that, once you get used to thinking like that, then you do comparisons. This starts to look like something else successful, and the answers start to reveal themselves to you. Um, also, um, the reasons why something can't go forward is also a parallel that you'll begin to notice. Great. Well, um, guys, I think that's kind of a good point to end. Um, I just want to thank Bob again for uh, being part of the community and for offering, you know, giving your time today. You know, I really enjoyed, uh, and, and I think everybody could agree, uh, wonderful stories there. I love the, the theme of knowing yourself. Um, I think entrepreneurship, as you hit, you know, is really a, a self-reflective journey, right, where we, you learn a lot, you make a lot of mistakes, you, you celebrate the highs, uh, you know, really high, the lows are, are lower than probably working in a, a big organization. But um, yeah, well, so guys, I, I just want to um, say, you know, a couple words about, uh, so for those of you that are in our startup studio already, thank you guys for joining this. We'll see you soon. Um, for those of you that are new to the community, just a word or two about FedTech and how to get involved. So we run a big range of accelerator programs. Some of them are, are uh, startup studio in nature, where if you're an entrepreneur and you want to start a tech company, we'll pair you up with the technology from our research partners. And, and put you through a cohort that helps you start something new. Um, we also work um, with some uh, accelerators that are slightly more mature companies, so uh, seed and series A stage companies. If you want a mentor, you know, if you, to be involved in that, you know, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can find everything at our website, fedtech.io, um, in terms of how to get involved. And then I'll defer to Lindsay, is, am I missing any, in just any announcement wise things? I guess we can talk about next week's uh, session. Yeah, I think you covered it. And I put our website in the chat as well. Great. Okay. And, and next week, uh, we have Lillian Ting, who is another one of our mentors who runs um, several angel funds. And Lillian is a uh, fantastic experience and is going to be uh, a great resource. Anyone that has any question, questions about what investors look for, please tune in next week. Um, we'll make announcements on LinkedIn uh, and then other social media just with some of the details. But uh, if we can do one more virtual uh, round of applause for Bob. Um, thank you, Bob. And we will see everybody. Have a great week.
Yeah, Ben, they were great questions and thanks for the opportunity and, and everybody stay safe. Thank you. Thanks guys, bye. Bye everyone.